I'm Phil Reed. I'm a professor here in chemistry, uh, associate chair for the undergraduate program. I'm also director of this poorly acronym center, MDITR, which is the Center on Materials and Design for Information Technology Research. Think photonics. We do things photonics oriented research. Um, what we're here today to talk about is a little bit about uh, undergraduate researchers, RU programs, and mentoring in general. And what I want to do is kind of cut this into two bits. The first bit is to really discuss a little bit the objectives of RU programs. What are we trying to accomplish from both, you know, very a meta perspective all the way down to kind of the individual perspective. Then the second half, what we want to do is kind of talk about strategies and tools as mentors you could use to basically make sure that the student you're working with, the undergraduate, has really a positive research experience. And a lot, I'll say right now, if there's one take home message, you know, first of all, thank you for being mentors. It's kind of, you know, actually it's kind of cool to help somebody kind of go through science. I really enjoy that part of what I do is mentoring people along. Hopefully you will as well. But not to put any pressure on you, but the success is largely dependent on kind of how you function as a mentor with your undergraduate. A lot of the success in terms of how the undergraduate feels about the experience really is going to rely on you and what you bring to the program. So what we want to do is give you some strategies for hopefully optimizing success in that. Um, so from a meta perspective, this is, you know, one of the things our center is sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And one of the things the NSF really loves you to do is do vision statements, mission statements, every other statement in the world. And so for our uh, center, one of the things we had to come up with was kind of an overall mission statement, especially with regards to education. And uh, one of the things to broadly define all the activities we do, of which the RU program falls into a bit of this, is really to define educational diversity programs that will develop a globally prepared workforce capable of maintaining the U.S. at the forefront of critical IT fields. Okay. What we're trying to do with an RU program, broadly defined, is entice people, undergraduates, to basically pursue STEM careers. End of story. We have, as a country, a real lack of people basically entering STEM fields and getting advanced degrees. And what are you programs are one strategy that funding agencies, the NSF, NSF in this particular case, is using to hopefully increase what's called the STEM pipeline. Just think the number of students that are pursuing advanced STEM degrees. Okay. Our program, and again, I know I've got some mentors from a few different programs, but we all, you know, just everybody kind of focuses on students at various parts entering this whole idea of am I going to do research as part of my STEM activities and career as a whole. We're focusing basically on a rising sophomores, so people who finish their freshman year, thus rising to sophomore, and a rising sophomore or rising juniors who are sophomores, just completed their sophomore year, and then rising up. So kind of students early on in their educational process, they present to this program with a skill set that's viable. They can do research, but yet they're not seniors. They haven't already formed opinions about this is exactly what I'm going to go do. So we're kind of getting them in a really good spot to bring them into research. Um, and let them explore you know, what it means to actually pursue a STEM career. And again, we've had over, this is over, well over 100 students right now. Since 2004, this program's been going on and just got renewed for another three years. So it's been highly successful. What makes this kind of unique is that our students are spread over three campuses, University of Arizona, uh, University of Washington, Georgia Tech. And the strategy for that is that we can actually use the intellectual firepower on all three campuses and resources on all three campuses to make a much richer experience than you can with students just simply at, say, the University of Washington or Georgia Tech on a single campus. And like RU, all RU programs, a key component is to provide undergraduates with first-hand experience involving research. Okay. So, had an RU program for a while, you can look at our other RU programs. RU programs are incredibly surveyed activities. We do pre-surveys, we do intermediate surveys, we do post-surveys, we follow them on Facebook, we track them down, we figure out what we're doing. This is what the NSF wants to know. How effective is your program or where you start? at the beginning is to ask them how do you feel about research? As an, you know, coming into this program, not having done research, where are you at mentally in terms of this process? And the first thing you ask is, well, why are you participating in a summer research program? And you can imagine a variety of answers for that. Um, lots of them want to learn more what it's like to be a researcher. A lot of them simply, as an undergraduate, really don't have ability to do research. You might be at a primarily undergraduate institution that doesn't have a big research portfolio, not a lot of summer research activities, places to get involved and they want to explore that so they look for RU programs. Um, a lot of it is, I thought it would be fun. For a lot of them, it's a lot more fun than a regular job. I remember, I being, I remember being a gardener as an undergraduate. If I could do photonics research or be a gardener, I think I would do photonics research. <laughs> and so you get a lot of students that come in and say, look, it's, it's a way to get a stipend, get paid, and actually do something I'm interested in doing. So, and that's a fine reason as well. 
And a lot of them really are exploring this idea of, do I want to go to graduate school? Maybe in engineering or in natural sciences or so forth. And that's a really interesting thing. If you think about it, a lot of students don't know what it means to go to college because may be, there may be nobody in their family who's going to college. Right? So we have first generation college students who are exploring this for the first time and really don't have a background in their family. And we have to have programs to entice them. Now you narrow that even further. How many families have PhDs, researchers, and STEM fields that they can look at and say, oh yeah, I know exactly what that career looks like. Very, very few. So for a lot of them, their RU experience is their first glimpse into this world of STEM career, higher education, to be a professor, to be a researcher. What's that actually mean as a career choice? Because a lot of them just simply don't have any exposure to that, what that means as a career choice. And so these programs provide that for them. What challenges do they face? Let's say they're enthusiastic, they're looking forward to it, they're really excited and ready to go. The challenges a lot of students present with, none of which, all of these can be overcome, so, but it's kind of a daunting list nonetheless, is uh, you know, they have modest technical skills, especially you know, somebody who's just done, let's say, a rising sophomore, if they've just finished freshman chemistry, right, for example, and that's largely an exercise in boiling water at regular intervals of time. That's all they do in undergraduate laboratories, and now we're asking them to do photonics research. That's a huge step in skill set. So they're going to have a limited skill set with which to engage in the research that's going on in the summer, and we need to think about that. Um, they're developing personal skills. Anybody who's been around undergraduates for any point in time, time management skills is always a struggle. Being able to communicate uh, written orally, the skills they have or just communicating what they're thinking and the questions they have in general can be a challenge. They're used to learning primarily through coursework. They're used to going into a lecture, sitting down, and having somebody tell them what they need to know. Hopefully in lecture they're moving that paradigm around a little bit. It's not all sage in a stage, but they're used to going somewhere and receiving information. right? In research, you kind of got to go out and get that information. You got to be more proactive. And so this is kind of their first chance to say, it's not all laid out in front of me. I got to go figure out what this means. Use the resources around me to go make progress on a given point. And that's a really new skill set for a lot of these students. Um, and finally, a lot of them have no familiarity with research whatsoever. They don't know what it means to do research. And so this is a really great opportunity. This can be a really exciting experience while research is great. Or it can be a very mundane activity, which is what we want to avoid. We want them to do things that are exciting and, again, aligned with the skill set they present so they feel like they are actually making progress. By the way, students are really well aware of the, their limitations as well. And from our entrance surveys, if we ask them, what's your biggest concern about your REU experience? You want to guess what the answer is? I don't want to screw things up. That's what they feel like. It's basically, they're coming to the lab, we're giving them this great opportunity, and all they want to do is not butcher things in the end, <laughs> right? And so right away, it's kind of like, wow, that's a, you know, I've, I've thought about this for years. I'm like, that's a really interesting way to approach research. It's almost like from like program failure. Well, I know there's a really high probability I'm going to screw things up, so I just hope that doesn't happen versus I want to make this a real positive experience and I'm really looking forward to, you know, learning a whole bunch of stuff. Don't get me wrong. You will get those students, but the majority of them really are fearful that their limited skill set will translate into being a burden in the lab. And we just want to be cognizant of that when we're working with them. Okay. So what factors impact success? And this is from a variety of studies that you can actually look at and say what makes for a successful uh, summer research program. Um, enthusiasm for research, that comes from both them and you, right? And I understand is uh, hopefully you've been picked as good mentors, you're excited about your research as well. Sometimes we get fourth or fifth year graduate students that are like, look, you know, I just want to do my dissertation, I just want to do this, I'm going to help you with the summer experience, but really, you know. And that's, again, they're going to feed off your enthusiasm, and I'm going to mention enthusiasm right away through this talk. You've got to be enthusiastic, and you wouldn't be doing, you know, be a graduate student, be a postdoc if you didn't love science in the first place and didn't love research. So just let that enthusiasm shine through, and that's a large part of the success, or the keys for success for this program. Um, they love spending time with faculty mentors, they love spending time with graduate students and postdocs, in, in fact, you know, the more time they spend, the better. And I think really in the exit surveys, what you see is the interpersonal relationships that really matter a lot to them. Yeah, they've learned a lot of science. Yeah, they've gotten a lot of experience, but they have these people that help them along and they feel like, you know, they've really kind of built this, you know, friendship, variety of ways, and mentorship, however you want to think about it, with the graduate students, with the people they've been working at. And that means a lot to them when they leave. So we want to be cognizant of really trying to establish that relationship as strongly as possible. You gotta do something that seems like real research, okay? And I mean, I, you know, the cliche is you don't want them coming in washing glassware in a chemistry lab. But furthermore, there's also not necessarily just simply washing glassware, but just busy work experiments. I'm gonna have you, you know, I've got 
42 molecules where I want to take the Viz UV spectrum of. So why don't you go ahead, make up solutions, and just keep hitting the red data button 42, 45, 50 times and bringing it back to me. That may be useful for you because it's mind-numbing, but it also gets pretty mind-numbing for them as well. They can master hitting the button pretty quickly. So you want to be careful to not give them projects that are just really so low level that you're really not giving them an opportunity for growth. It's nice when the research can be leveraged with things they've done in the major. We have a challenge here, especially in a photonics research center. Photonics is not a big part of the undergraduate curriculum. In fact, it's usually advanced topic type stuff. So when you're dealing with the rising sophomores, rising juniors, you really have to struggle to say, hey, what you learned in freshman chemistry, here it is in the lab. And, you need, and so it's not, and again, I think sometimes when I work with mentors, they feel it's pedantic when they do that. It's like, oh, obviously they'll see the connections. They won't. So anytime you can make that connection to something they know, it just really kind of it brings the exp experience to life. If you've had a really good experience, they take ownership of it. It's kind of like, I really like this research, and the next place it's going is here. And when we do the poster session over at Mary Gates Hall at the end of the summer, the students that are the most turned on are the ones that are saying, here's what's going to happen next, right? They're really seeing this project in the future. They've taken ownership of it. And that's another thing we kind of want to do as well. Obviously, you want to do something that's a well-defined experiment, but you want to give them the opportunity to really see where it's going to head next generation experiments and after they leave. So if I could focus on a few things, enthusiasm and their interaction with you, those are the two keys. That's like 85% of the battle in order to make this a real positive experience. So we have measurements of impact. It's kind of funny. Um, it was two or three years ago, I got a call from the NSF and said, well, you've been doing RU programs for a while. Uh, do you know where your students end up? And I was kind of like, well, I thought you guys would be doing that since this is like, you know, you've been doing RU programs since, what, 76, 77, and that would be a big part of the success metric is what do students do. It turns out it's only recently in the last decade that we've really been paying attention, which we should have been earlier, to what is the impact of these uh, programs in terms of where students end up. Here's a little, uh, just kind of taken from, in fact, in your handouts, I've got the references on the back, but here's basically an undergraduate research opportunity survey of participants asking them, for example, this upper one is initially when you entered the program, what was kind of your terminal degree? What were you shooting for at the end of the day? And you can see we've got some BA folks here, and this, is, this isn't percentages, these are just raw numbers. Um, masters, some folks with PhDs, some MD stuff. At the end of just that one summer program, the uh, thing that really impresses me is that the bachelor termination goal almost just gets wiped out. Everybody sees themselves going further, right? They're going to do masters, they're going to do PhD, maybe even MD went down a little bit, so we're pulling them into actually research careers. That's cool, from, but from my perspective. Um, you can see that's a pretty transformative experience, and you see this in multiple studies across the board. What it says to me is you're really changing their perspective. They see, you know, I got into college, I'm going to do my four years, I'm going to get my degree, and I'm done. And they don't think what's next. And this gives them an opportunity to say, hey, what's next? What are the other opportunities out there? So I really like that graph because it really shows the transformative impacts of this program. And secondly, if you ask them, if you expect to obtain a PhD within the next 10 years, how important was undergraduate research in your decision? Again, just kind of raw numbers here. But you can see extremely important is a big deal. And you, you talk to you know, most prospective graduate students coming in saying, well, do I want to work at the University of Washington? First thing I always ask them is, tell me about your undergraduate research. Every one of them tells me about their undergraduate research. That is a big part of deciding that's what you're going to do next. And for those students that don't have access to research as undergraduates, except through an RU program, that's an incredible opportunity you're creating. Okay. So mentors are important. This is a, a quote from this particular uh, science paper here. Some mentors who are able to combine enthusiasm, there's that word again, with inter interpersonal, organizational, and research skills. And we're going to go through this skill set here in a bit and give you some things to think about as you're kind of building your mentor portfolio. Have a large role in facilitating positive outcomes in undergraduate research. Really, you kind of set the stage. You set the foundation. You set the direction. The student comes in with the enthusiasm. And in that partnership, you're the key part in making this thing go. Okay. So what makes for, quote, the best mentor? And here's kind of some identifying, uh, if you like, characteristics of folks who really have functioned well as mentors. And this kind of comes from the, uh, translated from the comments of undergraduates. First of all, is mentor is a role model. Um, students look to see themselves in you. You are a role model. As I kind of say, you don't get to pull a Charles Barkley here and go, I'm not a role model. Don't follow me by example. If you're a mentor, by definition, you're a role model. You can't escape that. And so to embrace that and just kind of recognize, you know, they're seeing a little bit of themselves in you and kind of through you exploring what the future could look like. It's a, it's, it's a great position to be in. 
Second, diversity of the experience is key. I think society in general has this perspective of researchers as being, you know, lab coats, graying beards, you know, doing solitary thoughts of great things as they're wandering across campus mumbling or in their lab. That's not the way research is done anymore, right? It's a collaborative exercise. People bringing different skills, different backgrounds, different talents to the problem. So what makes for really good mentors is those people who can bring diversity of experience into the research program, okay? So I don't want you to think that it's all on me as a mentor. Yeah, that one-to-one -one relationship is important, but you should be exposing them to other folks and bringing them into the collaborative aspect of research that really characterizes any research lab you walk into at the University of Washington. So diversity of experience is really, and working with different people is a real key component of a successful, of being a successful mentor. There's this book with this incredibly corny title, um, Advisor, Teacher, Role Model, Friend, which I won't drag you through all of. You can read it, but I mean, you can read the title and figure out what it's gonna say and so you not read the next 150 pages. But it is really true. Obviously, there's teacher that's going on, you're advising, you're obviously a role model, and they also look to you for friendship as well. And that'll just evolve over time. It's a natural thing and people get together. All right, let's transition here. Now we know what we wanna do, we know what good looks like. How are we gonna get there? Okay. First things first, as, and these are, before your students get here, you should be thinking about all of these things as mentors. You don't wanna, it's not when the student shows up and you shake their hand, that's not the first time to be thinking about it. You need a battle plan before you even talk to that person. You really should have a vision for what this experience is gonna look like. First part of establishing the foundation for that vision is to make sure the research the student's gonna be uh, involved in is level and background appropriate, okay? Level, self-explanatory. Background, you know, we have this all the time. We have people who come in, um, photonics in particular. Theoretical particle physicist, you probably don't want to put them on a synthetic project. Bad idea, right? They don't know which end of the beaker stuff goes in, so this is not going to work out at all. You want to make sure they're doing something that is really appropriate to the skill set. They bring in the interests that they have as well. It can be tangentially different. It's okay to explore something that's a little bit different for 10 weeks, but if it's radically different, orthogonal to their experiences, it's going to be really hard to make progress. Hopefully, in the process of matching you with people, we've looked at student interests and things like that and said, oh, they're interested in doing synthetic chemistry. This would be a really great group for them to work in. And so we've kind of already done a little bit of the matching, if you like, background to lab in uh, the matchmaking of setting up this program. Um, you need to, it's essential to communicate research goals and activities. This is a big deal. What are we doing? Why is it important? And what will this experiment tell us time and time again? But as graduate students, if you think about it, you're asking yourself that question all the time as well. You know, why am I doing this? Why is it important? If I'm gonna do this experiment, why, am I, why have I designed the experiment this way? They have all the same questions, probably at a simpler level, but still at the same level. And so I think sometimes with some of my mentors, this is kind of, what are we doing? Why, why is it important? When the integrators start asking that, the mentor kind of recoils back and says, well, you know, look, maybe they don't have a good answer to that. So they're like, well, cause I said so, or cause the PI said it's important. If you find yourself saying that, just take, don't worry about it, just take two steps back and go, yeah, why are we doing this again? And just kind of explore it. You don't have to have all the answers right on the spot. But it's worth giving it some thought of, really for every experience, what are you doing? Why is it important? It's a question they ask themselves time and time again when they're doing the research as well. This is a big one. I think you should ask if the research is gonna to contribute to the scholarship of the discipline and also the research efforts of the group itself. Some of the poorer experiences we have had is where the student feels like the project they're on is tangential to what the group, main group is working on. You can imagine being in a group meeting, for example, and they're talking about stuff, and you're doing something that's absolutely, totally different. Everybody else in the group is like, what are you doing? I didn't even realize we're doing that project. And they feel like they've just kind of been orphaned in the whole thing. So making sure the science they're doing is really part of the overall research mission of the group, and that they see that it's incorporated into that mission is a key part of success here. And finally, they want to know what they're going to learn. I think everybody, you know, if I'm going to invest 10 weeks, hard time, what am I going to get out of this? What am I going to learn? And it does not hurt to revisit as the thing proceeds the skill sets they've learned. And you do that in a variety of, you know, hard ways. Oh, well, you know how to use that instrument. Now go ahead and use it. Soft ways. Wow, you took some really beautiful images with the microscope here. You're really getting proficient at doing this, right? And they get clues to, oh, I guess I did learn that, pick, that skill. Well, I did actually pick that up. So, and they like accumulating skills and being able to check things off that they've learned. Um, for you, you're gonna have to develop a style. Not every mentor is the same, and that's why I don't, 
I like to give out worksheets that have bullet points to say, do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, although I'll, I'll violate that rule and do a little bit of this at the end. But you gotta develop your own style. You can't fake it, right? And every mentor is a little bit different. So the first thing is, I mean, rip people off wherever possible. So what were the positive mentoring experiences you had and incorporate that into your style? You do not need to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, the flip side of that is true. If there were negative experiences, yeah, don't duplicate those. Maybe go away from that and do something else. Um, can you incorporate those experiences into your style? Maybe, so, maybe it worked for you, but maybe it's not something you're comfortable doing. Discard that, because it's just going to be fake. Um, uh, why do you do research? Why do you like science? These are, I, I realize these are very introspective questions for a graduate student, but you know, they're ones to kind of keep asking yourself time and time again. And I think that's, again, this is where your enthusiasm for these activities will come through when you're really comfortable at the core of why you're excited about what you're doing as well. Um, and finally, how can you pass your enthusiasm for your research onto your students? And there's, you know, everybody functions differently. There are cheerleaders. I say, this is really the best science we've heard. It's absolutely fantastic. Where well, that may not be the case, but they'll still sell it like, you know, a used car. There are other people who are really quiet about it as well. And they're just kind of like, you know, yep, we're going to write this up. This is going to be, you know, we're going to write this up in a publication. We're definitely going to get you on that. It's going to be really great. That's a way to actually demonstrate enthusiasm as well without being a cheerleader. But the student knows you're definitely enthusiastic about the work or you wouldn't be publishing it in the first place. So there are quiet ways and loud ways to give the, to express your enthusiasm for the project and what's going on. And the student will feed off of that. And again, more on developing your own style. Um, Some of you, kind of in the way you conduct your research, you really, it's very free form. It's like, you know, I've had students that if they talk to me, you know, every other week, that's about all they can tolerate me. I don't know. It's just kind of how they work best, basically, is they want to go but think about their own problems. I've had other students who want to talk to me. Can we have coffee in the morning? Can we, like, right before you go to lunch, can we talk? And when you go home, can we talk again? They want to talk a lot about what's going on, right? And that relationship will evolve as things go on as well. So I think you've got to kind of figure out what works for you in terms of, you might drive you crazy to talk to somebody five times a day. Okay, don't do that. But at the same time, recognize that the undergraduates really need a lot of support on this. So I would say, if you're gonna err on either side of this, err towards more structured, because I think they really need to be reassured that they're on the right path. You can't let them float for two weeks. And if, you know, we've had that experience where, if you'd like, uh, mentors kind of treat them like mini graduate students. Oh, they'll find their way here. Go ahead and think about this project. And in two weeks, why don't you tell me what you want to do? That's a, that's a huge high bar, and a lot of folks trip over that. So you want to lower the barrier there, really have a battle plan. This is the research we're going to do. Here's the activities. And kind of you know, have a structured relationship, especially in the first few weeks, to make sure they're on a good trajectory. And again, the student you get is going to be different. Some students are going to come in, oh, you know, this is my second or third RU experience. Just leave me alone. OK, well, you back off a little bit. I probably wouldn't back off too much. I still want to make sure they got a good trajectory going. But there might be students that are incredibly uncertain about how they're doing and how it's going, and you just need to be more proactive in that. So you're going to need to get a sense in the first week of where your student is at as to how you're going to adjust your mentoring style to kind of match where they're at. And again, as the research progresses, hopefully your role evolves. And you know, you'll go more from really kind of teacher, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, to backing up big picture type of stuff. Towards the end of the program, we're going to be constructing presentations, posters, talks, written abstracts. And there, you're probably going to be a little bit more hands off and have them be more reflective of what the experience was and try and put that into their own words. So the structure of your relationship and how you basically interact with the student is going to evolve over the 10 week period as well. And finally, the thing is, you know, don't try and be something you're not. You know, and this is the biggest mode of failure for folks is they try and, you know, oh, they're just not genuine. I think students pick up on non-genuine really quick. So they want that interaction with you. They want that personal interaction. The more genuine you are about how you approach it, I think the better that relationship's going to be. Um, OK. More brass tack stuff. Failures from past, where hopefully we don't. Uh, we do these things. Uh, let your students know your calendar. If you're going to a conference, like in the middle of this, y you don't get to disappear and not tell the student where you went. It's really disconcerting for the student to go, oh, they're not going to be here for the week. I don't, want to do I don't know what to do next. Right? This is part of the diversity of experience. If they know other people in the group, you can still go away. But you know there's somebody else to help them. You've charged somebody else to say, hey, could you look after the student? Here's the plan for this week. Let's make sure they make progress. It's not that you're chained to the lab for 10 weeks, but just disappearing 
without letting anybody know where you've gone is just not a really great strategy. I know it seems obvious. You'd be surprised how frequent it happens because you just kind of forget about things. You get busy. Um, if you meet or talk to a student, indi uh, indicate what you expect to get out of the meetings. Maybe it's just a catch up. Tell them that. You know, there's many times, you know, it's, you're an authority figure. So if you say, hey, I want to have a meeting to talk about your research, first of all, fear. <laughs> Next thing is, you know, I better get all my data and stuff together like it's going to be an exam. And it's not an exam. You just want to talk and see how things are going. They're used to examinations. They're not used to just exchange of information. And so let them know what the expectation is for meetings so that you don't kind of build up that anxiety. Um, they want to know what the finished product looks like. And this is the hard thing with research is it's never finished. If you're asking good questions, they lead to other questions. And I think the biggest misconception students have, undergraduates, when they come in, is they think they're going to do a project, we're going to start here, we're going to end here, ironclad, done, finished. And I kind of tell them right away, the overall goal is to come in here and have fun, period. If we get something accomplished, so much the better. But I generally, with my students, don't put pressure on them to say, this is the end product we've got to get to or everything's a failure. If they get experience in doing research, that is a success. Everything else is ancillary to that. And they need to hear that because they think there's going to be an expectation for some end product that they're going to give you some. I mean, I had a student last year. He's like, well, I'd like to get two or three papers out of this experience. I'm like, two or three papers? We're still working on the first one, right? Because we asked a decent enough question, there's a lot more to come out of that. And so but we're still, I write them every once in a while and say, hey, you know, we haven't forgot about this research. Here's where we're at at this point. Keeping them in the loop and keeping that enthusiasm going. Um, Again, creating opportunities where students can be open and honest with you. Sometimes they're going to be uncertain about something. And if you're in a laboratory, it's really hard to express uncertainty or I don't know, say that word, I don't know, in a laboratory. I swear, for the 17 years I've been at UW, whenever I've run into this, you walk across 15th Street and you go to Bean and Bagel and you get a cup of coffee. Man, there's something magical about 15th. They walk across that threshold and then all of a sudden you're having this personal conversation and they'll tell you things that they will not tell you in the lab. So if you find them, you know, they're kind of quiet and they're silent and stuff, go somewhere else. Get them out of the environment and see if they'll open up to you a little bit and see what some of the issues are and so that you can deal with them. And at the bare minimum, you need to create a working relationship. Um, and again, if you struggle early establishing that minimum relationship, it just doesn't work. You know, this happens. Two people, just, it's just not going to work. Um, come to the people that are running the program you're on and we'll solve that problem for you right away. You do not have to suffer in silence or try and make something work that just flat out isn't going to. Let us know and we'll figure out what to do next. Avoiding the pitfalls. Here's again where we've had issues. We already talked about poor planning and management of the project. Basically, especially no foundational stuff at the beginning. Horror stories. Um, I had a student who showed up and basically there was nobody in the lab for two weeks because they were basically at a conference doing things. And so we kind of sent the student off to the lab and they came back and said, there's nobody there. And I was like, what do you mean there's nobody there? And it's like nobody, not only had they not given it any thought, they didn't even bother to put a note on the door that said, yeah, we'll be gone for two weeks. I mean, that's absence of planning and thought. Um, so we just had to put the student elsewhere and just say, forget it, right? So you want to have a plan right away for what they're going to do. So when they come in here, that first day you meet them, you can talk about the research and big thing. You can say, look, here's the task at hand. Here's my plan, at least from getting from point A to point B. May not work that way. This is research after all, but at least this is our first trajectory that we're going to pursue. Um, research roadblocks that aren't addressed. Um, a lot of, uh, there's some groups where it's like, oh, well, you can't make the spin coder work? Well, go try it again, right? Well, go try it again is not helping somebody solve the problem. That's just running them back into the same wall. So if they're struggling with something, you got to roll up your sleeves and get next to them and say, what's, what's the problem? What's going on? Can I bring my skills to kind of help you get over this hump? Okay. Just, you know, this is, this goes for me too in life as well. Sometimes I get so busy, I'm like, oh, just go try it again. And after I've said that two or three times, I'm like, Phil, just get your rear end up out of your desk and go help them, you know? And so I think sometimes keep that in mind. Isolation from the group, and this is the number one issue we've had in RU programs, and you've seen in other ones as well. They don't feel integrated into the research mission. They feel like an appendix, if you like, basically not basic contributing in a meaningful way. And nobody wants to spend 10 weeks feeling like you're just, you know, there, right? They want to feel like they're a part of it. That means things like that, like in group meetings, like sometimes, you know, group meetings are pretty technical discussions of things, especially for somebody who's like a rising sophomore, rising junior. After a group meeting, take them out. You got any questions about that? Did you find this thing interesting? Letting them know that you're interested, that they actually kind of at least are engaging in what's going on is a really important part of that. A lot of folks are saying, well, they're going to group meetings, so we're incorporating them into the group. That can be a really cold experience if you're sitting there for an hour and realizing you don't have the foggiest idea what anybody said. That sets you up for isolation right away. And you need to give them time to kind of help teach and bring them into the 
culture of your lab and the intellectual space of your lab. Um, you will run into per, you know, personal problems outside of research. You are dealing with human beings, right, after all. Um, so sometimes they'll have personal problems. And again, when those come, you don't have to solve those yourself. That's why we have uh, directors of RU programs. You come and ask us, and we've got experience on how to help people through things. Sometimes it's, you know, I've, but we've dealt with this, like, single moms who didn't tell us, like we had one of those, and it was kind of like, I'm kind of really missing my kid. It's like, well, why don't you go take, a, go back and see your kid. You don't have to spend here 10 weeks in isolation from your family, right? You can do, th you know, this, these are problems we can solve together. You'll be surprised at things they won't tell you because, again, they don't want to show weakness or I don't want to get cut out of the program if I tell them I got this problem. We deal with problems. That's fine. Um, and an adequate or negligent supervision, I think I've hammered that point enough. Solutions, I would say, I would set up a weekly meeting outside a lab just so you just get a feeling for how things are going, not technical. Just how's the research going? How are you feeling about it? Are you enjoying things? Sometimes it's like, wow, you know, my roommate over in the dorms is a real pain, you know? So, and you'll get information like that that you can bring back to us and we can kind of solve and debug those problems as well. But a real key for this is to give them an opportunity to talk to you. Feeling that there's no interest in their work, again, that sense of isolation, and again, it, I get a project that's aligned with the research you're doing. Definitely strive for that. It takes a little bit more work. But if you can get that set up, it's really critical for success. Too little practical help given. And a lot of, so folks who are doing materials research, a lot of times they'll send your students over to like the microfab or something like that and it's go, oh, go over there, get some training and figure this stuff out. You're asking for a student to do a lot of things in there. So make sure when you send them on a task that they know what's expected of them and they have the background to basically do the task and the resources to do it. Don't assume they'll be able to assemble their own resources and solve their own problems. It doesn't really work out very well if you do that. And again, I always, especially in the summer in general, you know, I still try and come down every morning and just kind of chat with folks and just see where everybody's at. Just that daily check-in. Maybe it's only five or ten minutes. They're going to go do the synthesis. They know what to do. Fine. You got everything you need? You got, yeah, I got it. No problem. At least you've checked in and you know they're on a good trajectory. It doesn't have to be a big ordeal, but just checking in and making sure they're making progress and solving any problems that might come up. There will be like abstracts and things that the students will have to write and they're procrastinators right, always. So they're kind of like, I want to get some more data before I write my, own. oh, it's due in 36 hours. Okay, well, you know, I'll write it in 24 and maybe I'll give it to my mentor and maybe they can make comments in the next eight hours before it's due. Don't get into that situation. Definitely when there's things they have to deliver, push them to start working on it early so that you can give your, help them refine whatever the deliverable is in a reasonable pace and not do everything at the last minute. Apps from the department we've talked about. Lack of research experience, always be encouraging. Every mentor will have this, you know, you just want to say sometimes, you know, are you kidding me? You know, you don't know how to do that. It, it just stop that language right away. You just, you can't use that phrase, right? You just have to be, oh, you know, that's disappointing. Or, oh, oh tell me more about that. Whatever the phrase is, it takes it off of making them feel like, it's a lack of skill that's the problem. We're trying to build skills here, so you want to be as positive as possible. And support their learning, and again, their lack of relevant skills or knowledge, make sure you've got you know, initial plans for research that are really aligned with the skills that they bring. Don't expect too much. And it's, I think it's really, it's easy to overestimate what they're capable of. It's really hard to underestimate. So you can just keep it simple to begin with. And then if they're like fantastic students, and you can just ratchet up the difficulty and say, oh, let's try and take something that's a little bit more challenging. That's a lot better than starting something that's really challenging and letting them kind of falter. Um, finally, problem signs. Things to look for in kind of students in general, how, you know, how to know that maybe you should be intervening a little bit. It's not going the way you think. Um, lots of postponing and procrastinating, and kind of missing meetings. Um, we had a, one of this last year that was kind of actually pretty serious. Lots of missing meetings and lots of, which were early warning signs that something much deeper was going on. So if you're having trouble with the students sticking to schedule, there might be something going on there. You can call in help. Focusing on the next stage of the project instead of the current task. It's always funny to think about what's next because that's, you know, that, that's going to work for sure, right? But this thing you got me doing right now, man, this is a real struggle and I got to battle through this. Um, that's the hardest thing to learn about research is you've got to stay focused on the task at hand. Complete that. Have an eye towards the future, but you just can't move forward until you get that thing done. Okay? And I think that's patience in doing research is what I'm saying there is a skill that they really need. Filling time with other projects and tasks not related to research. If they're spending two and a half hours a day on Facebook, there is a problem. I guarantee you there is. So I come down in lab and announce sometimes. You'd be surprised. People are, and it's not lunchtime, it's like two in the afternoon, three in the afternoon, massive chat windows, stuff like that. If they're doing things that aren't related to research, that's, 
they're trying to occupy, they're looking for distractions, they're going elsewhere. And so you don't say, get off of Facebook. It's just an indicator that you really need to sit down and figure out what the issue is. Um, and finally, intellectualizing practical problems. We had a couple of our students last year, we had to work on this. Well, I can't do this because the following things are, you know, I've read the following three papers and I see these are issues and so I'm not even going to pursue this until we figure all this stuff out. And this is, especially with experimental science, I guarantee if you think long and hard, you'll figure out a reason not to do something, right? And so sometimes you just got to roll up your sleeves and go, you know what, we've looked at the practicality of this, we're just going to go attack it. We realize there might be some issues here. I appreciate the issues that you're bringing up, but we're going to go attack this thing. Let's go. Uh, rather than just sitting around talking yourself out of experiment after experiment. And that's a common one for graduate students too. And there's a real common one. Be proactive. Talk to your students about their work. Push students to set goals. Again, providing explanations, plans. This is another big one too. Keeping documentation about outcomes from meetings and stuff like that. It gives you a record that you can reflect on, a record they can reflect on as well to kind of see their growth. It really does document growth in a lot of ways. Um, and it also makes sure that expectations are met. Everybody's on the same page. Sometimes you say something, they hear something different. In written email, it's really easy to, for everybody to be on the same page. And I think that's a good way to go. So above all else, last time, enthusiasm is a key element. And the earlier enthusiastic, the better. And I think every study you read about RU programs brings this element up. It's your enthusiasm that's really the key part of making this go. Um, and again, I would say too, it's kind of why we have these uh, mentor meetings and things like that. You'll meet other mentors over the course of the summer program. Kind of rely on each other too. Sometimes it's, you know, wow, I'm working with this student, I'm kind of struggling with this, what things you do. You can learn from each other as well. You're not just individual silos dealing with people. And so you've kind of got a mentorship community here already created. And sometimes it really helps to maintain your enthusiasm by really working with other people in the same spot you are. That's the other reason we bring you all together. I could have just done a PowerPoint thing and said, go ahead and read it and you're done, check the box. Not interested in that. I want you guys to work together a little bit as well because I think it makes for a better mentoring experience. And references in case you're interested. There's a whole literature on RU things and evaluations of RUs that I won't go through. Um, some of this is pretty good. There's actually some really good hints. You got to push your own institution at Grad Washington EDU Mentoring. There's actually a pretty nice collection of things down there that the university's put out. And this site here at a TAMU is Texas A&M University. I spent a lot of time worrying about RU things and actually have kind of a nice collection of uh, resources for people that are doing summer mentoring. That's kind of nice. Um, with that, what I want to do, I'll take a few questions if you have them, but I want to leave you with, you know, thank you once again for volunteering to do this. I think, uh, well, the success of this program really relies on our mentors, are the people that are in there really working with the undergraduates one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I, I just think it's so exciting. There's such great research going on at the University of Washington, of which you guys are a part of, to bring undergraduates in on that and give them exposure to that. You've already won. They're already going to have a great experience. And everything I've talked about here is just to kind of really embellish on what's already a great foundation for a positive experience.